This is Jonathan Rubin, your host today for New York City Friends of Clearwater, Inc.'s education program. I have with me Stephen Gradman, president of New York City Friends of Clearwater for 2009 and 2010. Donna Stein, vice president of New York City Friends of Clearwater to his left for 2009 to 2010 and Fred Berg, an environmental activist with New York City Friends of Clearwater. Stephen, I wanted to ask you, since you're, you're probably on this set, the longest member and leader of the group, what is the mission of New York City Friends of Clearwater? New York City Friends of Clearwater was set up to support the statewide Clearwater organization in its valuable work of keeping the Hudson River clean. It was initially set up to clean up the Hudson River when the water was a disaster. And as Correct. it's gotten better, we continually work to keep cleaning and to uh, keep the laws in place and enforced so that the water uh, remains clean and will be clean further. Also, we're very concerned about the quality of drinking water for the city of New York and for other environmental issues. What has been the historical record of success of New York City Friends of Clearwater on, on, on specific problems that you haven't just discussed? Uh, it's hard to isolate because we work with other groups, but uh, the Hudson River is certainly much cleaner than it was in the past. And uh, New York City now has a recycling program. That's something we pushed for when there was no recycling. and. Uh, so, you know, we've certainly had success, but it's, we don't have statistics that I can give you a percentage. What can you tell our listeners today about this vital hydro-horizontal hydraulic fracturing issue that's confronting the, the New York State residents, specifically in New York City? Uh, well, I think this process is a grave threat to our drinking water. Um, New York State uh, most of New York City drinking water is unfiltered, and uh, the people of New York have had certain protection that certain land would be left undeveloped and that the watershed area, the supplies, uh, the 8 million plus people of New York City would be kept pristine. And now this is threatened because of greed and even because of state government trying to get itself more money and I guess they're looking to tax the gas companies and the gas companies want to drill and use this fracking process which means using water to drill that's contaminated with all sorts of chemicals in close proximity to the uh, to our water reserves to the watershed. Okay. Um, you, you touched upon one of the important issues, that this issue is not just um, a drinking water issue, it's an economic issue. Um, besides the tax base, what can you tell our listeners that the landowners and the residents of these towns and the people of New York State should be understanding about the economics of the issue, both from a local and an international perspective? Obviously, natural gas will generate power and will get generate a certain amount of energy and is worth money so there'll be income from the gas but the offset to that is contamination of drinking water and it will cost billions to build filtration systems that may not even be effective that probably won't be effective in eliminating these hazardous chemicals that would be put into the water by this fracking process. What, what, what can you tell, um, fracking has been done in states outside of the New York, some connected with the Marcellus Shell and some in the w Midwest. Do you, do you know what the results have been on the health of human beings either allowing fracking on their land or fracking occurring in neighboring lands? I know there's been an increase in cancer rates. From an economic standpoint, and uh, you can just see it straight from economics, uh, the, the government needs more money right now, and the, gov the governor is looking at raising funds. The lobbyists for the natural gas uh, people are making it uh, attractive to them, but it's short-sighted. 
because if you, for any problem that we have, it's always a good idea to follow the money. And uh, it, it's better to follow the, what is the common good. Uh, the common good is that we want, we have the cleanest water mm -hmm. in, in the whole country, New York area. We have a natural aquifer that all of our water goes through, feeds 90% of the, of the area. What fracking does effectively is it drills deep into the shale, 3,000 to 5,000 feet into the shale, putting toxic chemicals into the shale to break up the shale so they can get the natural gas out so they can make some money and use the natural gas. They can get natural gas uh, elsewhere, but they see that natural gas. What they're not telling people and what they didn't tell people in the Marcellus area that you mentioned that there's talked about in, was that movie Rage of Nature? Um, yes. By Josh Fox, mm -hmm. uh, is that there is the danger of pollution. Even, no matter what they tell us, because they want to make the people who are trying to make money, no matter what they tell us, there is a danger that our water supply, our pristine water supply, that can never be duplicated again once it's destroyed, those toxic chemicals that they push into the shale can break into, can seep into our water supply, ruining it for all time. And it would be a $23 billion plant that these uh, uh, financial people will build to clean water that we already have. It's clean by nature. Fred, what can you tell us about the local Sorry. economies and the local perspective on fracking from the landowner's perspective and from the government's perspective concerning the, the employment in these uptown communities where unemployment is, is a high, is a significant problem? And what can you tell us about the problem from the perspective of the governor who has to think of, of the costs of, of energy from overseas, specifically from the Middle East? Uh, in the, the, the cost, you know, can only uh, be a further burden, you know, per, uh, foreign energy purchases can only present further burdens on, you know, the long-term uh, debt of the state. And, uh, you know, the more we can keep, uh, uh, you know, energy production through, uh, you know, ecologically safe means uh, on site, you know, uh, within uh, the uh, boundaries of the state, the cheaper it's going to be for uh, people. And it'll probably create jobs if there's, you know, if, if there's alternative energy sources developed fully with uh, tools and expertise for provided by people, you know, by, by our own uh, citizens, state citizens. And some of the landowners, you touched upon mm -hmm. those points that I wanted, but some of the landowners are saying, how dare you ban, ban me from selling my land for a massive profit? Should we give in to the profit greed of landowners and f say that capital and property are more important than human health for nine million citizens of New York City who will be affected by the fracking process if done near the Marcellus Shale? Shouldn't the governor and all the government, including Assemblyman Brennan who sponsored a bill and the Frack Act sponsored in Washington with the federal government, shouldn't the government be concerned not only about the health of its citizens, but shouldn't they say that profit isn't the only focus when we deal with energy, that human beings' lives are at stake? Shouldn't we say that um, clean water, which we've been fortunate to have in New York State and New York City specifically because of the canal system and because of, you know, the aqueduct system should be maintained? Uh, I, think, I think it's all that and more. There's a lot more, you know, that uh, there are the benefits could be, you know, would, 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 you know, probably make a major contribution to turning around, you know, people's uh, attitudes about the economy as well. If there was, you know, if it, if it was, uh, you know, more, more geared in the manner that you're suggesting. And uh, the, the uh, uh, aftershock, so to speak, the rippling effect of, you know, trying to uh, keep this within state control would be, uh, you know, manifold manifest through that if the if the state but let me just add if this if if the governments both the state and federal governments don't get involved in this and uh, you know pass appropriately wise legislation regarding this is pro private nonprofit foundations probably will step in because there's a there is demand out there for it. 
Stephen, we as activists and educators with New York City Friends of Clearwater are upset about the process from the standpoint of disclosure. What do you say about the government and the corporations, not Chesapeake Energy Corporation, which has been very decent to us and said that they don't want to frack or gas drill in upstate New York, but what do we say now to the, to the corporations and the government that it doesn't want to admit four-fifths of the chemicals used in the process? We just have to say, be forthright, tell us what is involved because the safety of the public health is at stake, and this is vitally important. So we can use whatever. We're not a, a group you, that normally brings lawsuits. We're more of an education groups, but the groups that do should proceed legally and uh, try to get this information from freedom of information requests or whatever, and the public has the right to know. The more information, the better, if I might add. And I also want to uh, m mention that I think, uh, I, I don't know why, it's just something intuitive, but I think uh, many of the utilities and, you know, uh, support in this support uh, sectors that, you know, that support the utilities, not just ele electrical utilities and water utilities, uh, but, uh, you know, um, uh, what was the old traditional telecommunications, you know, now the modern 21st century telecommunications. They're, you know, they're all, uh, you know, anxious to have a, a lot of information out there and, and to be able to use it wisely to benefit people's, uh, you know, lives. Fred, um, you were on the show the other day and we discussed um, some of the chemicals used. What can you tell our listeners that we already know of the chemicals that are seriously detrimental to the health of the citizenry that are used? Specifically, what chemicals, three chemicals, can you uh, remind I, our I, listeners? It, uh, actually, I, I can't remember the specific names, but the uh, harmful effects are, uh, you know, could, could be devastating, contribute to chronic illnesses. What's really key is not for people to mistrust the drinking water, but to get educated about how to make sure that their drinking water is to meeting their satisfaction and their needs. And if they have, uh, you know, so you can do simple uh, home uh, experiments or, you know, like smelling your water and making it, you know, and then and, and, uh, ensuring, you know, taking a look at your pipes, whatever is exposed. No reason to, like, you know, uh, pound through the walls, but just look what's it exposed. If you see rust, that means there's corrosion building up. And um, there might be more impurities in your, you know, in coming into your apartment or your home. Uh, some simple, you know, things, uh, you know, do-it-yourself kind of things can be, uh, you know, a huge benefit. Uh, some people like to boil their water if that, you know, gives them the satisfaction, takes away an odor that they think is harmful. Uh, that's that's their predilection. Uh, you know, the the, uh, uh, the controls that can be put on, you know, are, uh, uh, you know, have been tried from time to time. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes it, it doesn't work, like the... Uh, By the way, I don't think boiling water is ever going to do anything except a... Uh, palliative uh, effect, it, it kills, dr only reverse osmosis might take out the well, chemicals. Some people, I know some, I've seen people s set up fairly simple reverse osmosis kind of things, you know, where they just boil it, capture the steam, and then... Okay, okay that might work. For, for our listeners, I myself as president of New York City Friends of Clearwater from 2007, 2009, had to do a catch-up education program for myself, and I was able to access three DVDs, Rage uh, uh, of Nature, Split Estate, put out by New York Water and Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, headed by Joe Levine. And I also, Joe Levine, accessed to me uh, PhD Theo Coburn of Colorado, an endocrinologist discussion of the health effects. For our listeners, though, this is very serious. One of the chemicals going right now into our water with the minimal amount of gas drilling that's done in New York State is radon. Another chemical is arsenic, a poison. A third chemical, benzene, has been used in this process and uh, demonstrated in these films, not only to be as part of the process into the drinking water, but when people have turned on their kitchen sinks and held a uh, a lighter or a match to the kitchen sink, it exploded in flame, not to, to the harm of anybody because basically it was controlled. But if there's enough benzene in the water to explode the water, water isn't something that usually turns into a gas flame. 
And if there's enough benzene in the water, how healthy can that be? And as our, list, as our guests have pointed out, two of the side effects of this process, which has been egregiously done in Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, and Delaware and Highland, Pennsylvania on the Marcellus Shale, has been the fact that it has caused cancer and seizures to people who thought that they were selling their land for the, the benefit of the whole, when in reality they harmed themselves because of personal greed. Basically, the problem is a capital and property problem. And while we touched upon employment, and we touched upon the tax base, and we touched upon the, the, the problem of international de dependency on international oil, the fact of the matter is we did not touch upon the problem of um, landowner greed, which is really at stake here. A lot of people in the key communities think, oh, I'm going to make my millions for living here all this time, and I'm a very poor person, and who cares about the effects on the, the urban dweller? They don't care about me. Why should I care about them? But the, with the interconnectedness of our world, Stephen, what is the problem? The problem is that the water from upstate comes directly down here to New York City, so we're certainly connected. You know, the, the water comes right down, and not only that, it mixes with other water in the water supply. So the effect of what's done upstate will influence people all over the New York metropolitan area. Can you tell our listeners wh why the, wh what watersheds on the Marshallis Shell feed into the New York City water supply? Well, the biggest watershed is the, Cat, uh, is the Catskill, Delaware, the Cat Dell system. And uh, I don't know, are there others? Yes, the Croton system has one-tenth of the, the water supply. But the problem is, as you pointed exactly on, on point, the Marcellus Shale, which is directly where the gas is that they want to drill for, feeds right into with the aquifers that they're destroying and with the, the chemicals that they're using in, in, the, in the fracking process. It goes into the underground water supply, and that water supply 90 is, feeds right into the Catskill Delaware water, water, where, Delaware water system. And 90% of New York City drinking water comes from the Catskill Delaware water system. And our listeners should be really reminded, it's time to talk to your government officials. Fortunately, people like S Borough President Scott Stringer, who's published a report, who led a rally uh, for a hearing here in New York City, he's right on target. He really knows what's going on, as does Assemblyman Jim Brennan, as does Representative Maurice Hinchy, as do a lot of the people involved in the process. Maurice Sinchi, for those listeners who are unaware, sponsored a bill called the FRAC Act. Could you tell our, our listeners, Fred, about the legal and legislative possibilities uh, to block this horrific gas drilling process? It, it appears to, to some uh, you know, people who are watching closely that there are you know, uh, uh, en enemies amassed uh, you know, at the battle lines. Um, you know, there, there's uh, other people I've, I've uh, you know, seen uh, comments from, especially on the internet, w where I've been able to track some of the uh, people involved, legislators who are trying to, you know, develop coalitions to keep it, you know, to keep the discussion positive and constructive, so that you know, good legislation can get passed that's protective but promoting of productivity, uh, and you know, and and enhancing of technology will allow technologies to get advanced. Uh, but there's also people that have, you know, that are just uh, not interested. They are uh, uh, driven by profit motive. They're insecure. They're driven by greed and fear, uh, you know, and uh, they uh, are kind of just, uh, you know, are very kind of, you know, un-21st century about it all. And, uh, you know, not, uh, there's a lot that can be accomplished, uh, you know, and a lot of people can benefit when, uh, you know, legislation is passed and implemented on a, you know, good constructive level that has a lot of consensus and support when, uh, you know, special, you know, certain special interests that get involved, uh, you know, and they mess things up for people, then you got people, you know, worried about the tap water. And that's not good. 
It's a basic, you know, it's a basic uh, uh, feature of uh, American life that you know that we, uh, you know, have to trust that it. it's not just for drinking; it's for uh, bathing. Uh, uh, children, hospitals are so dependent. You know, anybody involved in healthcare is so dependent on, you know, being able to trust the water system. Uh, you, you know, it's it's vitally important, and just can't let things happen that get interfere with that kind of trust system that gets it's so built up so well. Stephen and Donna, you were present for the viewing of the film Flow for Love of Water, which talked about the international water crisis. Stephen, mm -hmm. what can you tell our listeners about the international water crisis and why that is a crisis, and what are the what are the problems there? What are the corporate problems? What are the government corruption problems? What is the crisis in many parts of Africa and Asia and India regarding water? And Latin America also. The water supply has been sold to commercial interest, and then the people who need drinking water to survive have to pay significantly more for it. And yet the World Bank th seems to think that's a good idea, even though, you know, people in other countries, you know, they, they have income of like one dollar a month, you know, or something like that, that where they can't possibly able to buy a dog bottle of water. Pay um, for the bottled water. Donna, yeah. I remember <laughs> vividly when I watched the film Flow, uh, 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 a really horrific s passage of um, the camera showed this woman walking to get her water supply. And what is the problem? We have the technology. There's Vivendi, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, Nestle's, those corporations have the purification technology. Why is it not getting to the people who are dying of impure water? There, this is not a minor issue. This is a global issue of grave consequences. We're all human beings here. Why does greed not be outweighed by human survival? I think we all sort of tend to come into uh, simplistic answers or, uh, and simplistic questions when we're thinking of a problem like why, why doesn't everybody just see this, I see this. Um, uh, it brings to mind the, uh, the, re the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger called The Red Planet where on Mars they were selling air and that everybody if they wanted to breathe they had to pay for the air. It's like that's a scary place when we have to come to uh, paying for our water, our air, things that are the most basic to our needs. <laughs> so uh, when you ask why, I don't know why everybody doesn't see it the way that we see it. Uh, I think that the average person does. You're right, Donna, absolutely. And what I wanted to convey by bringing up that woman who was walking all day, that was her job, to leave at 6 o'clock in the morning to walk for five hours to get a, a vase of water to hold on her head and walk all the way back to her family so that they could have a couple glasses of clean water mm. to survive. Her whole entire existence was, was based on providing for the family and allowing the family to survive. She didn't have, she couldn't make a living because she had to provide this clean water for her family. So her younger children had to work children who normally would be in high school and middle school, they were working to raise money for the family. And the mother, the provider in this family without a father, had to, her job was essentially the water gatherer. Now, of course, we know that it's a simplistic thing, but the corporations that I mentioned, they have the technology, and it's not just the corporations, they're not totally at fault. The governments and the local community leaders are corrupt. But between the two of them, they're not allowing for human survival. And human survival isn't a joke. And we're all human beings here. But obviously, some human beings think that they're, they're them, as if we're not all human. You talked about, uh, you know, Brazil. They're such interconnectedness with this that, you know, people just don't realize it. The weather doesn't know, you know, country borders or state, bo state boundaries or, city, you know, even municipal, uh, you know, boundaries. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, when it rains, it, the rain, you know, the Mother Nature uh, you know, does not discriminate between, you know, raining on, you know, maybe sometimes it's one side of the mountain and not the other, you know, or one side of the valley and not the other, but they don't know uh, these, you know, boundaries that are set up. So, you know, we have to engender cooperation between, you know, with people, and, you know, and, and if there are different techniques being used to, 
you know, spur people. I, I, you know, one of my most memorable scenes in one of the various videos is to, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, a mom holding up a glass of water uh, after, you know, t g g you know, getting it out of, a, reaching into a pail and holding up the glass and looking to see if it was clear before handling it, handling it to uh, the children there. So, you know, uh, people know about it. It's, a, it's almost innate with some people. Fred, you talked about community groups possibly being involved in litigation. We, we talked about government officials being against the process of fracking, horizontal hydraulic, gas drilling, fracturing in the Marcellus Shale, and we talked about the Frack Act. But isn't this also about activism, Donna, which is something that you um, ha were instrumental uh, about in the water festival that we held in June for Pete Seeger in honor of Carl Schwartz, our deceased leader? The Water Festival was uh, was how I got involved in this organization in the first place. Uh, I was attracted to the um, to this organization. Yeah, I, I I'd be glad to talk more about it. and I'd love to um, at, uh, on a diff on another show. Thank you very much, Fred, Donna, Stephen. I appreciate you. your involvement with the show. Thank you. Thank you.